Dr. Robert Groupie is the author of The Change, a textbook for guided corporate transformation and creating the future, containing his most requested radio commentaries. Featured in Who's Who in America, he has given keynote presentations at Oklahoma City University, the University of Central Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State University, among others. For six years, he hosted the television program Creating the Future on Cox Cable. A father with four children, all served by the Oklahoma City educational system, Dr. Groupie has a personal and abiding interest in the work of the Oklahoma City Educational Television Consortium. Over the last 15 years, I've had the opportunity to host this program. I've been consistently amazed with the educational partnerships that are being forged with the community, with business and industry, leading to the educational opportunities being even more marketable to Oklahoma and the nation. We're going to look at some of these cutting-edge partnerships in today's program. And I have with me from OSU OKC, Eileen Dewey, who is MIS faculty, to talk about information technology, but specifically, Eileen, internships and how powerful they are in the learning experience. Almost well, definitely, and thank you for having me. Um, I work with the Information System and Technology at OSU OKC, and we have three main programs there. We have the Computer Information Systems, the Information Technology, and the Management of Information Systems. Uh, the students have just flourished with the opportunities that the employers are uh, making available to them through uh, our capstone projects. And the, the capstone's taken normally at the very end of their semester, uh, after they've completed all their other core projects, uh, uh, subjects, and um, one of our, um, in the e-discovery in our information technology area, they uh, did some internships. There are about four students that did some internships with the Canadian County Sheriff's Department. And uh, that was an exciting time. They are introduced to real cases, real, uh, real crime, and how um, the digital forensics is involved with that. And they get to um, troubleshoot and uh, recover that and how the evidence chain is, is not broken. And that's such an amazing thing as we were talking before the program about how forensics has changed right. over the years and, and that it is, is now so, so computerized in many cases. Right. Everything leaves a digital footprint and uh, the police and um, any anybody has to have that knowledge how to recover that information if it's lost. Uh, some of our computer information system students get to um, do help desk, and help desk is a growing need. As long as we have computers, people are going to still need help. And Dell is one of the major people that take on our students, and they intern there. And uh, they learn lots of uh, soft skills and um, just general troubleshooting skills. Then we have the management of information system students and um, logistics does play a, an important part in so many of the areas, but our students there have done internships after um, they finished the program. They go to, they've been going to Devon in their logistics area. And in the energy, I know it's a, uh, the economic times are not great right now, but they still have to look for ways to cut costs as well. So the students there developed a database helping them track some of the trucks and the cars that are out checking all the oil wells, and they were able to uh, cut back on their budget just a little bit Isn't on that, that development. Isn't that amazing that technology is, can become so comprehensive that, like you say, it can be used for a tool to streamline? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, everything has a barcode, you know, and when you're doing inventory, you have to check that barcode, and um, it helps with the inventory. So everything has a type of a, a point of sale, and it's all computerized today. What about students? What's the criteria to be in this program? Anybody, anybody. If you just have a love to learn, just uh, uh, anyone can do this. Where their niche is going to fall, that's kind of on them. Most of them are, all of them are going to have to take specific courses, um, of course, in, in the general um, technology area. And then the programs separate themselves out from there. Uh, that's when they find out where their calling is, what it is that they want to do. Do you find different age groups respond differently to the well, computer processes? Are the younger people more comfortable with this? or how? Well, how the, the younger people, 
you know, I think that the younger people, they were, they were hooked up to a computer in the womb. I mean, they, they're so used to the technology. Um, whereas maybe some of my older students are more intimidated. But the learning process is the same. The young ones come in and they still find out that, hey, maybe I don't know everything. And they, they do find uh, an area that they really, they appreciate and they like. I'm, I'm looking here, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at creating home and business networks. Yes, um, opportunities, uh, again, everybody has a computer and if you're starting a small business, what better way to do it than build your own network? Uh, that way you have control over the security. You know what, what traffic's coming in, what's going out, and the, the needs of every day uh, that that particular business would need. So that's a growing interest and uh, they have networking classes at OSU OKC and they're thriving. Now, we hear the words hackers or cybercrime, but where does this come into play as far as keeping systems stable? Well, I don't, I, I told you earlier, I don't care for the word hacker. Uh, I think that it has a, a, a negative um, feel about it. Uh, secure auditing. Uh, students need to know coding if they're going to go um, look into a system, how to reverse engineer something horrible that's come in there. So with the systems audit, uh, you can go in and, and you're looking at it and you begin to see signatures that shouldn't be there. And that's how they learn with that. But in every aspect, everywhere, I think all the IT people are gonna have to have some of that knowledge. They're gonna have to know how to, how to look for that, um, how, how to get that off the system. There's viruses and things uh, to that nature, so that they'll be trained in that. And that's kind of why I approached that, because that's, that has to eventually be part of the learning process, is not just how a computer should run, but what can keep it from running properly. <laughs> that's exactly right. Anyone can hack into a computer, but I think the real talent lies behind the person that can keep that from happening. There's more uh, time that's spent into keeping them out than to actually getting in. Anybody can get in, but are you talented enough to keep them out? There's the challenge. This is so interesting. This should get a lot of folks interested in this program and <laughs> wanting to come through your, your class. What's the length of the class, and, and uh, is it a set enrollment time? Uh, we have different, uh, it's a, uh, we have summer classes, we have spring classes, and we have fall classes. Uh, some of these are eight weeks, some of them are 16 weeks. Um, just come out and, and apply. What's great about our programs right now with the three programs that we have, we just recently got a two plus two articulation agreement with OSU IT in Okmulgee. Um, they have bachelors of technology in different areas. And once you have your associates from OSU OKC, you can continue on to OSU IT to get your bachelors of technology. And you don't have to physically go to their campus. It's an online uh, system and it's I think that's advantageous for the students to so do they that. Can, they can build on and, and take it all the way to a bachelor's but what they're getting through you is that just considered a certificate or we have yes. hours? We have a certificate programs and we have the associate's degree. Okay okay so that and, and that is so neat that you can build, like building blocks. Yes. The associate to the, yes. to the bachelor's. We also give the students opportunities. There's uh, certs, certifications that go along with our class, like the A-plus certification, the Network Plus certification. And you, we ha are a testing center there at OSU OKC. So once they finish those courses, they can go ahead and get that, that certification as well. Now, do these internships also mean that they may have an opportunity to be already working with a company. Absolutely, and many of our students go on to be employed. We've had uh, some of our students are actually now working for the Canadian County Sheriff's Department because of their internship, the talent that they had. They they didn't want to escape. They wanted to they wanted to snatch them up right there. That creates a lot of marketability. Absolutely. And that's so important in education today. Yes. Uh, and you all are just absolutely being a pioneer with this. I'd love to hear uh, a success story, maybe a, a student you can think of who's come in and just absolutely fallen in love with this and has done great. Well, we have uh, one student, Mr. Escobar. Um, he came in and he, he knew he loved computers. And he started out, uh, not 
it was kind of curious, where, where am I going to go with this? And he was networking, but he found the e-discovery program. And he just loved it and took off and thrived with it. And now he works for the, the Sheriff's Department in Canadian County. What's so exciting about him is he comes back to our campus and he gives back and he helps the students that are going through some of those labs, the more difficult labs, and he encourages them and, and gives them some hints. So it's, it's a win-win for us when the students actually come back and, and tell our students how wonderful um, their knowledge is and, and, and just shares with them. And that's wonderful when you have that opportunity for that to happen. I notice also, and you may have mentioned this, three different degrees. Right. So would you want to elaborate just a little more on? The, yeah, on the computer things. information system. Uh, it that's a, a just a basic degree. It has a lot of the same courses in it. Uh, it's more on the, the help desk so, side or the technical uh, side um, for troubleshooting. Um, the information technology is the other degree. Um, that one has the e-discovery, it has an e-discovery certificate as well. Uh, and then the management of information systems is, that's basically it, it's a management of information systems. These students would go out um, and be managers over an entire information system shop. And as part of that aspect, at some point comes rewriting code for current systems? Well, in the, that we have a database and we have a, a programming aspect inside the CIS as well. And uh, programming is very, very uh, they, you've got to have some programming. Um, there's a lot of different languages that are out there and um, uh, the students need to know how to, how to program, yes. And so it just depends on uh, what they're trying to achieve with exactly, the computer system. Exactly. If they're wanting to be software engineers, then they're going to have to know how to code. And troubleshooting, we've already touched a little bit, but is troubleshooting becoming even more of an issue that they need to have that capability? Well, they need to understand what's going on with the computer. So many things can go wrong with the computer. And it may not just be uh, a software issue. It could be a hardware issue, and they need to be aware of uh, what it is that went wrong and why why that part's not working and, and how to fix it. And when your networks are down, today people panic. Oh my gosh, everything's connected. I was going to say, we just, <laughs> we don't know what to do. <laughs> you know? We freak out. How I can't even, I can't do anything. The network's down. So that's going to be real important for them to get them back up and on online. Um, productivity is going to go down and that's not acceptable, especially if it's a website. You don't want that website down. If you're taking revenue, if it's e-commerce of some sort, they've got to get that back up and running. I keep coming back to the word marketability. This is right. so wonderful. What do you see in the future? Let's project a year or so ahead. What do you see as far as uh, the growth of this? Well, the Labor Bureau says that it's going to grow a lot with it by 2024. So technical skills are going to be important. I can't think of any place that there's not a computer. So we need to know how to, how to fix them, how to back them up, um, make sure that they're, um, they're not leaking information, make sure that the integrity on, on the computers is intact. So I, I don't see technology going away at all. Do you see this eventually also getting into the Androids? As, as well as the well, laptop? Sure, sure. You're already programming robots um, to do things, and um, your cars, your cars are even uh, going to the technology. They're, they've got programs in them. So. so you will be training people to make cars work. <laughs> well, that and training them uh, how to prevent someone from hacking into Hack. that, that, that little car. Oh my, how life is getting so complicated, but thankfully you all are there uh, to, to be able to help us work through this. Uh, how did you get interested in getting into this niche area? Well, everything's computerized today. Um, I, I started out as a, a kindergarten teacher and uh, fell in love with computers, and that's how I got my start. I've got to have you back on to tell that story. Our <laughs> time is completely gone, but thank you so much, Eileen Dewey, MIS faculty with OSU OKC. We'll see you later. Thank you. Bye.
A little bit of history. Metro Technology Center's law enforcement teacher, Amanda English, reached out to the Oklahoma City Police Department a few years ago to develop a partnership. And that partnership has grown. And we have with us today Captain Paco Balarama, Oklahoma City Police Department, uh, Derek Lawless, who's the director of Metro Tech South Bryant Campus, and Freddie Silva, who is a Metro Tech cadet, to talk about this program. And uh, Captain Paco, if I could begin with you, tell us uh, how this program has come about and grown. Mm -hmm. Well, as you said, uh, Instructor Amanda English, she's the one that reached out to the police department and really it was an effort to have uh, local industry um, in the same field as they were teaching involved in their program. And quite frankly, we're, we're very glad that she did because uh, it's flourished into a great partnership with the Oklahoma City Police Department. Um, it's developing um, a lot of young people who want to be police officers and it's uh, very positive overall. What type of training, uh, some specifics, is, is taught in that law enforcement program? Well, all the basics from uh, traffic stops to a little bit of uh, uh, accident and, and crime scene investigation to uh, communication. Uh, really, communication is the biggest aspect because all the things that, that, that we teach as far as in police work um, are developed really in the police academy. What we want to focus on now is we want to, we, we want to focus on communication uh, and our personal skills and, and really uh, for them to become good people. Which in some uh, companies are called soft skills, mm -hmm. the ability to build rapport. Absolutely, and in uh, law enforcement, um, it's the most critical um, area. Uh, basically, we're in the people person, uh, in the people business, and we're and seeing that more today. Absolutely, throughout the country, how important that rapport is. Absolutely, communication is everything. Police work, uh, everything from getting cooperation from victims and witnesses, but also in de-escalation to be be able to, to build rapport with somebody, calm things down, talk things down, and be able to solve it peacefully. Let's talk about marketability. What's the demand for police officers in Oklahoma City? Well, in Oklahoma City, it's pretty big. I mean, keep in mind that we have uh, uh, almost 1,200 police officers, which means every year we have about 35 to 55 uh, retire. And uh, we have to replenish those ranks. And we can't replenish those ranks with just, just anyone. Uh, it has to be top quality people who uh, have the skills, have the ability to do this job. So what is the vetting process? You, you mentioned the ability to to communicate, willingness to communicate, to build rapport. You're talking about listening skills, patience, a lot of different issues that, that go into that. How do you vet folks to uh, be well, in the Well, it's very difficult to do that, but that's why the partnership with Metro Tech is so important because we start developing uh, relationships with these young students at a very early age, sometimes 16 and 17 years old. And we get to know them, we get to know their families, we get to uh, teach them those very, very important skills, and we get to uh, really motivate them in what to do as far as decision making. You know, one of the most important times in inner city kids really is between 16 and 21. That's, those are the times in, in, in your life where sometimes you make some very bad decisions. But with uh, uh, students such as, uh, such as Freddie, we're able to uh, mentor, we're able to really pour some, some very valuable knowledge for inner city kids who a lot of times don't have the, uh, uh, the support system at home. And we can tell them, look, you know, here's, here's how you should make your decisions. Here's, um, about, here's a little bit about goal setting. Here's a little bit about going after your hopes and your dreams. And they, they really listen. They really listen and uh, they really do what we, what we say and ask of them. So uh, Metro Tech is a, is a, very, a very good vetting tool for trying to identify um, people who we want to be future police officers. Well, and Freddie, you're shaking your head yes, you're agreeing. Yes, sir. And let's, let's hear a little bit about your story. How did all this start for you? Well, um, in the beginning, it was a couple years back. Um, I currently live in the northwest part of Oklahoma City and it's kind of a tough neighborhood. Um, directly in front of us where uh, it was a drug house. And I have two younger brothers and, some, and an older brother too living with me. And I don't want my little brothers growing up um, being like those people going there. Um, so I just wanted to do a change. That's why I joined Metro Tech. And they partnered with Oklahoma City, so I'm grateful for that. And I just really want to help my little brothers and hopefully they follow my footsteps too. What's it like when you're a, a part of this uh, and you're going through the process? What, uh, what are some experiences that you've had? Uh, like what do you mean by that? Well, uh, you know, we were talking about different qualities of 
patience, and communication skills, and yes, whatnot. These are things that uh, can be a little challenging sometimes, but they're learning skills. Oh, yes, sir. Um, they teach us how to, um, like every Friday, uh, the teacher puts random letters, um, words in, in a bucket, and we just pick them out and just have to make a whole five-minute topic about it in front of our class. So that's how we get to do public speaking. And in my school, we also do a lot of public speaking, like presentations. So public, speak public speaking is a part of what we do. Um, officers do a lot of public speaking, like Paco Valderrama, always on TV. And also, we learn how to stop people. Um, how to do it safely, officer safety, and stuff like that. So you're learning to be a communicator. Yes, sir. That is that is fantastic. And I want to come back to you, but uh, Derek, Derek Lawless, director of Metro Tech South Bryant Campus, fill us in some more on this program. Well, I think the vetting process, you mentioned that earlier, uh, we really try to get the right student in the, in the right program for the right reason. So I can say that our uh, cadet, uh, program is probably, as far as uh, student interest, is one of the 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 more uh, uh, the probably the most at, at our at the South Bryant campus has the most interest from from our partner schools. Students are interested in the program. They've they've uh, have friends that are in the program, and um, that is a, is an exciting piece of that. But we we try to to uh, interview those uh, prospective students and make sure that they really understand, you know, there's a lot of things that go into being a, a, a police officer and there's a lot of different career pathways you can take, but there's gonna be expectations put on those students and they need to understand those, what those are and what they're gonna need to do to become successful and be successful in the program. So we try to get the right student in there and from there uh, with, uh, Sergeant Tomas and the the, uh, the officer that's embedded in the program and the instructor's leadership, then they start that whole process of working towards becoming uh, a professional police officer. You were mentioning before the program in reference to their ability to integrate into, if they're from that community, if they have friends in that community, that this helps. Well, I, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take uh, much uh, watching the television or reading the newspaper to see that being a police officer is pretty tough right now. And nationally, um, there's a lot of scrutiny. Uh, and, and Captain Balderrama uh, kind of mentioned that earlier. Communication is key. These individuals, these young people are from Oklahoma City. They live here. They've, they've grown up here. They're, they have a vested interest in making their community better. And what better way to do that than to uh, be involved in a program where you get trained by Oklahoma City Police Department, you're mentored by officers, and you, you, you learn and grow personally and professionally and with the opportunity to, to make a difference in your community as a police officer. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity and that's kind of the, the, the flow of how, how we hope it's Going to go and how long has the how long has the program been in existence? We've had a law enforcement training program for about six years. How uh, actually? Uh, let me correct that. About seven years. Uh, Amanda English has been the instructor for the last like, four years, and this is the first year we've had the program located at the South Bryant campus. So um, it's been around, and a lot of the other tech centers have similar programs, but. Uh, none of the other programs have a partnership with the uh, with the large metropolitan police force like we do, and we're very, very proud and excited to be partnered with Oklahoma City Police Department. This this seems to be to me more real time. Roll up your sleeves. This is the way it really is, because how much can you learn in theory in a classroom? Well, that's very true, and and the great part about this is these uh, Freddie and the other students in there. They are. Uh, every day, there's the Oklahoma City Police Department has a presence in the classroom. Uh, Sergeant Tomas is embedded in the program. They are uh, they have uh, yearly inspections by uh, Chief City came and inspected the program. So it's it's a big deal, and uh, the expectations are real, and they're there, and the students know what those are. So uh, it's it's quite a 
it's quite an operation. Oh, well, Captain Balderrama, what do you see in the future if we look in a crystal ball or just postulate a few years ahead? What, what, would, what kind of growth would you like to see? What kind of results would you like to see from this? Continue. Well, you know, as far as results, we actually have the first three uh, Metro Tech cadets who are now OCPD cadets who will be um, eligible for, to apply in the Oklahoma City Police Academy. And really the first step is, is I, I would really much like to see the first graduates from the Oklahoma City Police Academy that, that really really originated in the Metro Tech program. So, um, you know, large scale, we'd like to expand the program. Uh, right now we're, we're starting relatively slow because we want to do it right, and we'd rather focus on quality than quantity. But um, I think it's going to have to grow, you know. Uh, from, from my understanding, you have uh, hundreds of kids who apply uh, for this program every year. Um, you know, Derek's correct that it's, it's one of the most sought after programs that Metro Tech offers. And uh, I think it's because, um, you know, I was incorrect in assuming that a lot of our younger people don't want to be police officers, but when I, when I saw the numbers of the, of the kids who were applying to this program, uh, that's not the case. Uh, I mean, you have inner city kids who maybe have never considered the possibility of being police officers who we're finding out not only are they considering it, but it's, it's, it's really uh, part of their goals and their dreams. And have they maybe never been approached with a positive message? Sure, absolutely. And, and uh, yeah, in today's day and age, I think it's, it's more important than ever to um, attract minority candidates, uh, to seek out kids who are part of the community, who have a vested interest in, in, in Oklahoma City. Why? Because it's their home because their family lives there, because they want to see Oklahoma City succeed and uh, really make it a, a better place to live in the long term. Well, Freddie, if I can come back to you as a cadet, let's talk about the future. Kind of uh, give me your, uh, your future as you see it. What, how would you like to see your life going in this, well, in this, this direction? Well, this year it's my second year. It's my senior year, and I hope to graduate from this program and also my home school. And after this, I want to get a job with Oklahoma City. By that, I could go to dispatch. I could go to um, um, the county jail. I could do multiple stuff like going to the zoo that they offer me. Um, I want to do one of those jobs, maybe county jail, and also take some college classes while I'm at it, going to school. And then by the age of 21, um, that's the legal age to uh, apply at Oklahoma City and do their academy and hopefully become an officer one day. Freddie, what do you tell your friends when they ask you about you being in this program? How do you explain it to them? It's, first of all, it's a family. Law enforcement's a family. And I tell them, well, it's kind of hard to explain because it's just the bond that you have with everybody there. Um, also, telling them the stuff that we do, and sometimes they don't understand what we do and why we do it. So kind of seeing it from as a civilian, as them. I count myself as a civilian too, but um, just the perspective that they have compared to ours is way different. Do you think for some of them it opens their eyes? Um, yes, sir, it does. And that's good? Yes, sir. Very definitely. Well, this, uh, we've got to have you all back and <laughs> talk some more about this because there, there's so much, and, and with society as it is today, that kind of message really does need to get out. So I, I appreciate you all for being here. Uh, Captain Paco Balderrama, Oklahoma City Police Department, uh, Derek Lawless, uh, Director of Metro Tech South Bryant Campus, and last but not least, Freddie Silva, really appreciate you being here, Metro Thank Tech you, Cadet. Thank you. The Commercial Food Equipment Service Technician Program at OCCC is an industry-driven training program. And with me today from OCCC is Lori Romero, Program Director, uh, Regina Clear, Education and Employment Coach, and Kelly Wells, Senior Instructor. Uh, let's start out. Uh, uh, let's start out, Lori, by talking about what what is industry-driven training and why is it so important. Well, in, industry-driven training simply means that you involve industry in the development of the training program, 
based on what their determined needs are in the workforce. Um, at OCCC and in the CFES program, we work with uh, employers in the Oklahoma City area who work in commercial food equipment service and repair. And we have employers who are instrumental, who have been instrumental in helping us design our program um, specific to what they need in the industry. So we're developing technicians to go out and work on and repair uh, commercial kitchen equipment and that requires a specified skill and uh, working with our employers we're able to identify exactly what those skills are and be able to design a training program specific to those skilled needs. It sounds like that enhances the marketability of that student's ability then to go out and uh, absolutely in the job market. Absolutely. Um, what we train our technicians on are some of the components in the, in the commercial food industry and electric, gas, steam, uh, refrigeration, hydraulics, pneumatics. We also have a soft skills component, which is uh, just as important as the hard sort of technical skills. Uh, we build on those um, uh, uh, job retention skills, the things that keep people in the workforce. Um, the job preparation uh, uh, skills, um, working with resume building and how to conduct a job search and those kinds of things. Um, one of the outcomes for the um, CFES grant is connection to employment. So it's very important for us that we graduate students with the skills to not just work in the industry, but to find jobs, to complete a resume, to go through the interview process. Um, and then that's where, once they get into the interview, that's where they can talk about their hard, hard skills, the technical skills that they've learned in the training program. Well, that sounds very holistic in that it's really preparing them for the whole process of life as it, re as it relates to employment. Uh, Regina, you are the education and employment coach. Let's talk a little more about soft skills. How do you coach for that? Well, first of all, for this uh, particular program, we have talked a lot with our employer partners about some of the things that they like to see, the things that they really believe are essential to their um, service technicians. And customer service is very important to them, and that's an aspect that we talk about. But also, it, getting back to the uh, what, what Lori mentioned is the, the job-getting skills. We start with a resume, making sure that their resume adequately represents their, their skills and their abilities and their training. Uh, we go on into interview skills. We want to make sure that when they go into an interview, they're, they're able to articulate their skills and let them know that they have those soft skills, that they have the, um, the customer service interaction that is necessary to work in a service industry. Uh, and then we, we really want to have a well-rounded approach to where the job keeping skills. We don't not only want them to obtain a job, but we want them to maintain the position that they that they get. So sometimes people they're they're able to get in the they're able to get that resume and people can look at them. They're able to um, make it through the interview and possibly be selected, but sometimes they have some difficulties with the soft skills on the job. So we go into uh, professional behaviors in the workplace, professional communication in the workplace. We talk about problem solving. We know that every position around has some kind of a problem solving uh, or problem situation where it's required to resolve it in a certain way. We talk about um, critical thinking and conflict resolution. And, and, and as I said, also with customer service, you run into a variety of, of issues related with customer service that can sometimes make or break the reputation of that company or that individual. So we really focus uh, heavily on customer service as well. Well, this, this is so very comprehensive. And let me, uh, let me ask uh, Kelly Wells uh, about the instruction that you're involved in. Well, it's we we instruct students in the basic skills of electricity, gas, steam, hydraulics, pneumatics, uh, and refrigeration. We also train them on safety as well, uh, as well as the customer aspects, uh, customer service, how to treat customers, and you know how to address the different equipment issues. 
we teach them basic skills to get them a job into, you know, in this industry, commercial food industry, and uh, teach them troubleshooting skills, teach them how to, to read electrical schematics and deal with uh, the different components and, and how they operate within the, the uh, you know, commercial food equipment. So uh, we have hands-on training as well as lectures. We watch videos. We do computerized simulations. So it's a whole plethora of different types of uh, formats that really seems to give us some good success. And uh, it's that combination, uh, the hands-on and, and the theory and the theory together. What about, uh, what about the criteria for being a part of this program? What, what are the... Uh, the eligibility criteria, yes, is that eligibility. what you're talking about? Um, well, uh, because this is based on a grant from the Department of Labor, the enrollment and uh, entry requirements, are it's a very low threshold of a dislocated worker. Um, uh, we also use the term in the industry um, incumbent worker. That simply means that somebody who is currently working but may enter into this training program with the potential for advancement in their field or an advancement in pay. We can take on incumbent workers, um, but it's primarily to get people who are long-term unemployed um, back into the workforce, get them, give them uh, usable skills and get them back into the workforce as quickly as possible. What's the length of the program? The program is a 10 to 12 week program right now. Um, we've made some modifications, again going back to um, industry uh, driven uh, uh, training program is that when we originally started the program in, in July 20, it was July 20th of 2015, it was a four to, four to six week training program. And uh, because of the input from our employer partners and CEFESA, who is the Commercial Food Equipment Service Association, their national organization, and they're helping us put this curriculum together, um, we've made advancements in each of the modules so that we focus more on um, the hands-on components and that sort of thing. So right now, we've gone from a uh, four to six week program to now we're at a 10 to 12 week program and we add the additional two weeks onto the end of the program because our OSHA 30 training we've embedded OSHA 30 hour training safety training into the program and uh, that's a self-paced self-directed training program and so sometimes it takes uh, students as little as one week to complete sometimes it takes up to two. And what about the age groups? What demographic do you seem to be appealing to? Um, right now, the average age of our student is 38. So we're dealing with folks who have uh, been, had some time in the workforce and maybe been out of it for a while, and so are coming back um, with new skills and uh, new approaches to getting a job and, and sort of the job retention skills and keeping a job. Let's talk about the future here for a minute. Uh, uh, what about uh, what do you see in the gr for growth for the program? How how long has the program been in operation? We started uh, July of last year, July twentieth, yeah. our very first uh, class, and uh, we recently are, are proud that we've celebrated our hundred uh, um, applicant. And so that's something yeah. that we're we're quite proud of and. The future we, we see is uh, just expansion. More expansion. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you look at the demographics of folks who are trying to get back in the workforce, you're, you're offering a, a, a wonderful alternative there to, uh, well, not an alternative, but an opportunity mm -hmm. for them to get back in. What about, and let me ask uh, uh, Regina this, what about success stories? Can you think of a success story, someone maybe who came in and, you know, didn't know if they were going to they get back in the workforce and how positively that's worked for them? Well, we have a number of success, success stories. Uh, one in particular was a, a gentleman in our first or second class. He was, uh, he, he didn't have any idea what he wanted to do. He was one of our younger, um, what, he was one of our, our younger um, participants and uh, he was working in a coffee shop, wasn't sure what kind of skills that he 
that he um, had or what he was interested in. And he went through the program, did very well, uh, became employed shortly after. And here now, a year later, he is still employed with that same employer where he was placed. We, ha we have another gentleman that actually um, had a job a week before he finished the program. We were able to connect him with one of our employer partners. And um, he started work shortly thereafter. But he was, he was interviewed and hired uh, a week before he completed. And Lori, maybe what are some comments that you've heard? Uh, I guess people will get back with you occasionally and tell you how much they appreciate having gone through the program and what it's done for them. Right. We have students all the time telling us, uh, even students who come from a completely different field who want to come in and, and uh, get this training so that they can work in the industry, who, who have come from construction industry. And we had a gentleman um, come in not too long ago and he uh, came back. He, when he came into the program, he was skeptical. He said he wasn't sure that he would uh, learn anything from it. So months later, and he never said in anything to us after he finished, um, but months later he came back and said, hey, let me tell you guys something that I never thought that I was going to be able to use these skills. And he went back into the construction industry but he said he uses those skills all the time, the basics in electrical, the basics in gas and steam and repairing HVAC equipment and that sort of thing. So very useful and transferable skills across a broad base of fields. Interesting. And I do have another question. And Kelly, uh, what about folks who've been through the program that you've experienced, the fact that they kind of have an awakening and realize that the soft skills are important? Yeah, they, they definitely are, and it, it takes more than just knowing how to fix equipment. Uh, a lot of times you have to fix people in the process, and you have to train customers on how to, uh, you know, they should do this type of thing before they call for service and take care of some of the basics. So those are the, the different aspects of that. Uh, and like Lori said, this is a... a a set of skills that are transferable to several different industries. We have people that have come in from the energy industry where they're, you know, laying off and, uh, you know, different types of work in that in that field. They come in and, uh, you know, a lot of people, like she said, they don't think that they're going to learn a lot. And by the end of the first week, they're like, wow, I can't believe how much I've already learned just in this short period of time. Do you kind of integrate some of the hard skills and soft skills at the same time, or are they segmented? Uh, sh she does her section of it, and then I kind of incorporate it as we're going along. So we both talk about it, we both hammer it home, and uh, we, we realize how important it is. So is there a little bit of a separation of power? Are you more soft skills trainer, or, how to, or is it really integrated with, with both of you? Uh, most of it is done by Regina. Uh, I take care of the technical stuff. Uh, but I've been, a, I've been a technician myself, I've been a manager, I know how to deal with the customers and the, some of the things that they're going to run into, so anytime I, you know, we're in a section where I can cover that and elaborate more on scenarios, then I'll throw that in there as well. Because you've got real life experience with mm -hmm. that also, yeah. which involves that soft skills of how you deal with different situations. Right. Well, I'll tell you, this is so comprehensive and I'm really glad that we were able to come in and kind of get an update. We did something earlier in programs on this, but it sounds like things are growing and, and will continue to do so. Uh, so I uh, really appreciate you all being here. Lori Romero, director of the program, Regina Clear, education and employment coach, and Kelly Wells, senior instructor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate it. With the explosion of technology, which seems never-ending, what about the strategies and, and, and the ways of bringing that and integrating that technology into the classroom? Well, I have with me Jared Scott, who is Assistant Superintendent of Instruction at Francis Tuttle Technology Center. And Jared, this indeed is a challenge, how to create the strategies that bring that into the educational environment. 
it's it's a big challenge, but it's it's also a lot of fun. Um, we we approach this uh, this challenge with uh, our partnerships with business and industry, and so all of our programs at Francis Tuttle are required to have a business advisory council, and so they meet uh, with our teachers and instructional leaders twice a year. And uh, we talk about curriculum, uh, technology, instructional strategies, all of those types of things because we want our students uh, to be trained on the latest and greatest technology. We want them, when they complete, to go to industry, to have relevant skills, and to be able to bring value to the companies that they work for. And so the only way we can do that is to uh, engage our business partners, have them at the table, make sure that uh, the knowledge and skills that our students are or mastering are, are related to uh, what they'll be doing when they get employed. So, And more and more the obviousness of marketability is so essential. You know, decades and decades ago, the ivory towers, <laughs> you go in, you get an education, you hope it has something to do with relevance. But today, like you say, it's hooking up with the folks who are paying the salaries to say, yeah. this is what I need. So how, how does that work? Well, uh, you have to have the current technology. We want learning transfer, and so we want the students in our programs, uh, when, when they complete, when they reach mastery of those knowledge and skills, that, that those skills transfer immediately to the workplace. Uh, but like you said, uh, technology changes so much and so often that they also have to have the critical thinking skills to update um, their abilities over time. And so not only do we want them to master uh, the technology in their classrooms, but we want them to know how to learn. Uh, how to continue to keep their skills current, um, how to be a part of a team. And so uh, this is something that you don't just learn once. It's a lifelong endeavor. Uh, and so in addition to um, the curriculum that they have in their uh, career training programs, they, they really have to learn how to learn so that they can continue uh, to advance their skills over time as technology changes, which it always does. And how do you integrate this learning into learn? Because a lot of us, if we haven't maybe thought through it, we think of just learning this, 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 and then I have it. Right. But you're saying you don't have it right. <laughs> at that point. Well, our approach to instruction, um, the students don't just sit there and receive instruction from the teacher. Um, sometimes the teachers will lecture, but oftentimes uh, the curriculum set out to where the students, um, really it's on them uh, to take the initiative, uh, to work through the problems, to master the skills. Uh, and, and that's unique uh, from one standpoint. Uh, students sometimes aren't used to that type of instruction, but what that really does is it gives them the responsibility. Uh, it gives them a chance, an opportunity to learn how they learn themselves. Uh, and they have to work through those problems. And, and oftentimes, if you walk in our classrooms, the teachers won't just simply give the student the answer. They will just ask them additional questions. And, and that approach really leads to students learning how to learn over time so that when they do exit, when they do uh, become employed, uh, and they do have to master new things, they've already been there in our classrooms. And so they're not intimidated uh, by that process. And as far as classroom, do you have individuals from business and industry come in? to uh, fortify and, and amplify on. Absolutely, we, we have guest speakers all the time. We, um, we have on-the-job training opportunities for students, internships, anytime um, we can inject workplace-related learning in our instruction, we do so. And that's the other key of having advisory committees. They're plugged into our programs. Uh, they're the ones that hire our students. And so by having them engaged and having them come and talk to the students, they're not just hearing it from the teachers, they're hearing it from people that will actually hire them in the near future. And so that makes a big difference in the motivation of our students. Well, share with us some examples of those connections. Sure. Maybe one or two that you can think of. I, I can think of our advanced manufacturing program at our Portland campus. Um, robust advisory committee um, have donated a lot of equipment to the program. Um, well-attended advisory committee meetings and, and employers come even from Texas uh, up to talk to our students and for our adult students oftentimes they will hire them before they even complete the program uh, 
Uh, and so that's a, a great example of employer engagement in the educational process. Uh, and it really motivates the students when they see employers coming and being involved and actually hiring students right out of the classroom at, with a good salary and benefits package. Uh, that's a big deal to our students. And so industry wins and, and our students win. And so that's, that's an awesome way to do education. And the, the equipment, the technology, that is something that has to be kept up. You were mentioning that sometimes the companies will provide some things so that they know when that person reaches them that they have that skill. It's critical. Um, we, we are always looking at our equipment to make sure um, that the, the equipment that the students are training on um, is the equipment they'll use in industry. Uh, and so we do, a, I believe we do at Francis Total a really good job of making sure that we have the latest and greatest equipment. But it is nice to have business and industry plugged into what we're doing and to donate the pieces of equipment that oftentimes are very expensive. Um, but they're happy to do so because they need a highly skilled workforce. And if that equipment is in our classroom and the students are training on those, uh, those items, uh, when they leave and go uh, and become employed by this company, they're, they're going to be successful. So. Internships. Is this something that happens occasionally? It, it does. Uh, we'd like to see more of it. Um, apprenticeships used to be popular um, years ago. They're not as popular anymore. Th that's kind of coming back. Uh, and so anytime we can do an internship, an on-the-job training, an apprenticeship, uh, a job shadow, um, we want to engage in that process. What are your projections? What are you seeing in the next few years for this program? And how long has it been around? Uh, advisory committees have been a part of career and technology education in Oklahoma since our inception. Um, it, without them, we wouldn't be successful. It's foundational to our success. Uh, we want students to complete and be gainfully employed. We want employers to have that highly skilled workforce. And so for that pipeline uh, to exist and for, for the students and the businesses to be successful, we have to bring the two together. Uh, and so it's always been a part of how we do business. Uh, and so for the future, we want to continue to do that. Uh, it's, it's key. And so looking down the road, uh, one, one new example of, of how this works uh, in our creative programs. You know, at Francis Tuttle, we don't confer degrees like a higher ed institution. Uh, so we have hung our hat on industry-related credentials or industry-recognized credentials. Um, but in these creative programs, uh, our advisory committee members have, have said, you know, uh, having an industry certification in the software package is nice, but we really want to see them apply their skills in these creative software packages. And so they gave our teachers feedback that, that they would like to see portfolios. Uh, and so our teachers took that information, worked with their uh, advisory committee, and they created a system, uh, a rubric to score student portfolios. And by the way, the teachers don't grade the portfolios. The students at the end of their, their time here, they have a capstone project. They present this portfolio to advisory committee members who score them. Uh, and they actually get to see the students' work. The students are motivated because, man, I get to present my work to employers, not just my teacher. Uh, and so that's kind of the future. I think more engagement and involvement um, with, with companies in, in these types of processes, I think, is going to be the truth. Isn't it true, uh, really a deep truth, that the deeper the level of ownership that that student has in the whole process of education, the more valuable it is to them? Intrinsic motivation is the key. Uh, a student is in an area that they have an interest. Um, they see how uh, what they're doing in class will apply to their future. Uh, they see employers come and present to the class. They see uh, employers scoring their work. Uh, those types of things motivate and inspire the student. Uh, and, and it's a beautiful thing to watch as an educator because that's what we're all about. The end game is a great job, a great career. And, and that's what we need to continue uh, to push. What are the criteria for an individual being in the class? Uh, we, we accept students. Uh, we have secondary students and adults. Um, if they're interested, we, we serve certain districts um, uh, at Francis Tuttle. Uh, and so uh, if they're interested in a program, they can simply contact um, uh, our Career Planning Center. Um, if they're interested, if, if this is something that they're passionate about, um, if they can see themselves in this occupation in the future, uh, we will work with them and we'll get them enrolled. And so um, we have fantastic students, many, many stories of, of success, of, of students finding their passion, enrolling in a program at Francis Tuttle. I want to ask you for one of those success stories. Share with me. Okay. 
Uh, just this morning, we had a, a STEM breakfast, and a pre-engineering student uh, spoke and talked about um, he had always been, uh, even as a child, uh, an individual that would take things apart and, and analyze things. And his parents really thought, you know, he's going to be an engineer someday. And, and they found out about Francis Tuttle's pre-engineering academy. So he's telling this story. And, and uh, he came to the pre-engineering academy. He was incredibly successful. Uh, not a surprise. Uh, he was a highly motivated individual. We have fantastic teachers, great equipment. Um, he transitioned after he left Francis Tuttle, went to university, got an engineering degree. He's an engineer locally here in the metro. Um, and so one of many success stories uh, that we have. Uh, and it just, it's, it's a wonderful thing as an educator to hear those stories, how uh, Francis Tuttle, how education has changed a life for the better. So, And, and the, I'm sure you have a number of success stories. Uh, and like you say, seeing, seeing that progression and that success, um, I imagine that's pretty fulfilling as an instructor. We, we talk a lot about purpose um, with, with our teachers, with our instructional leaders. Why are we here? Um, and, it's, and, and we have decided it's to change lives. Uh, it's bigger than teaching a class. Uh, it's bigger than a student simply just passing a certification exam. Uh, or, or completing the program. Those are all important things, but uh, we see over and over and over again how a teacher has impacted an individual student's life, has changed their life for the better. And that makes it easy for us to get out of bed every day and come to work because that really, that's what drives us um, as educators. And it's so interesting because this is what is achieving, has uh, the continual ability to achieve economic improvement in the state and the country for that matter. Yeah, and I think ap application is the key. Um, when, when students come and, and they enroll in a career training program, we do math and we do science, they do technical skills, but it's an area of interest. And, and when, when they find that hot button, that spark, uh, and they come to our program and they're able uh, to really show their stuff, uh, then they exit and they, they go to a company and they bring value to that company and it is an economic impact. And, and it's Everybody wins in that scenario. Educators win, um, the student wins, parents win, um, industry wins, and so it's 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 fun uh, to be involved. How in did it. you get involved in the year? I can tell you're excited about this. What? How did this happen for you? Well, I actually moved from Texas um, and enrolled at a technology center while I was in high school. We didn't have a technology center system like Oklahoma has. Uh, and so, and, and I sat there for a year and watched a career tech teacher change someone's life. Uh, and it, it left a mark on me. Um, and it was a, a computer technology program. I went on to university and got a degree in computer science. And I, I had a competitive advantage over my peers who were also in the, the computer science program because I had been at the tech center in high school. And so it was easier for me to go through uh, the content at university. Even though it was hard, I had that competitive advantage because I had experienced it before at the technology center. And I really saw how it could make a difference uh, for me going to uh, a four-year degree program and on into the workforce. And so that's why I'm passionate about it because I think it makes such a huge difference. Uh, yeah, two of my children have been through the tech schools here, and it's such a it's such a building block. It's like a bridge that they can then take and go on to a full degree. I think it's a foundational component, and I think um, there are multiple exit points of success. If they leave here and go straight to work, um, that's a success. If they if they leave Francis Tuttle and they go on to post secondary education and they have a competitive advantage when they do so, that's a success as well. So I think relationships are key. Our relationships with our, our common education partners, with our higher, higher education partners, with our companies, all of that working together uh, makes it uh, a wonderful thing. And so um, it's fun to be a part of. Well, I'm excited and uh, we'll want to have you back to, to see how this continues to grow because I think it's absolutely a growth area. Just the, the ability to to latch onto the technology, stay in touch with them, and develop the, the strategies. Uh, Jared Scott, uh, Assistant Superintendent of Instruction, Francis Tuttle Technology Center, thank you for joining us. Thank you.
we have overviewed an aspect of education as it effectively connects with students through learning partnerships. And that's a powerful vehicle that propels our state economy to greater success.